felt so good. We had a room full of brothers and sisters. Africa. Africa. For the Africa. For the Africa. At home. At home. And abroad. And abroad. Africa. Africa. For the Africa. and merge the difference and, and, and bridge the gaps from black people in America, in the islands, in the South America, in Europe, and Africa. And I realized this morning when I was getting up to come to this place that it is him who is responsible for us now physically be able to get off a plane and land in Africa with the idea of reuniting. So we now represent Brothers Garvey's dream He's somewhere there with us now. He's in the whirlwind with us now. He told us he would be with us in the whirlwind. He's with us now as Africans from America and Nigeria and Uganda and, and, and Tanzania and all of these countries. Are we here together? And we're going to have a discussion about our survival and our progress. We are doing what he challenged us to do then. It may have taken 100 years, but we're doing it, so I feel so good. So now we got to go on to this question. I asked the question, and we're not going to ask the question again, but we're going to do a vote in the room. The question was, who is responsible for the particular technology that goes into making this cell phone, which is probably right now is the greatest form of technology on the planet, where communication is faster, more definitive, and quicker than ever before in the history of the world. More dynamic as well. The question, who do we have to thank for that? My sister and brother, they said black people. They gave me very sophisticated explanations about it, but that was their answer. I gotta respect their answers. My other brother said the Jew. No doubt about it, the Jew. The small hat, the one with the little tiny hat, it had to come from the mind of a small hat because that's some kind of thing they can do because they can make a lot of money with this kind of thing. Every time you push a button and make a call, they can make money. It's got to be the guy like that. I know it's him. That's what he said. Now, the other one, my other brother said, someone in Europe, some white man sat down and some European came up because this is brilliant and genius. It's genius. It must have come from some, from some Europe. So I want to take a vote. It's either black or white. Nobody said it came from the Asians or Japan or whatever, so we only got it. Even the technology for this, the reason we are able to communicate in this way came from Africans or it came from Europeans. By vote of hands, how many people say definitely it came from Africans? Raise your hand. So I'd say about 85% of the room. How many people say, let's be realistic? The technology came from whites and Europeans. Let's just be honest about the situation. Raise your hand if you say, let's just tell it like it is. All right. So there were a lot of hands that didn't go up. So I'm going to assume if you didn't raise your hand for your people, African, that you voted with the Europeans. So we'll say about 90% of the room says it came from the Europeans. 10% of the room, for God knows what reason they were given, say it comes from black folk. Let's take a look at who we have to thank for the technology that's the greatest technology on planet Earth. The wisdom and the intelligence that came into this. Who thought this up and created it? The following is an I Am Solutions presentation. 
The Greatest Stories Never Told is a series of videos that highlights the little-known but significant contributions of alumni, administrators, and staff at historically black colleges and universities to provide a well-prepared science, technology, engineering, and math workforce. Today, we spotlight Jesse Russell, whose innovations in digital signal processing led to the modern cell phone that changed the world. The cell phone has revolutionized how we connect to our world. It has created a paradigm shift in how society communicates. Cell phones have become indispensable for businesses, families, and individuals. Its usage has gone up from 34 million to over 204 million in the last 10 years. Few of us can imagine life without our cell phone. But all of this would not have happened without the remarkable advances in wireless technology made by pioneers such as Jesse Russell, an internationally known inventor who graduated from Tennessee State. The beauty of, of historical black colleges for me, just talking to me personally at a personal level, is that what they did for me, they gave me the nurturing and the freedom to challenge they didn't shut me down. They, oops, and the teachers were more nurturing, or the professors were more nurturing, right? And what they did was they gave you a chance to express who you really were. If you're sitting in, in an SBCU and say, as I did in 1972, when I said, well, I want to work at Bell Laboratories, right? I ended up at Bell Laboratories in, uh, in 1980. Uh, I was selected as one of the most outstanding engineers in America under the age of 32. Coming from a very poor environment, single family, 10 brothers and sisters, at least uh, nine brothers and sisters, right, uh, out of Nashville, Tennessee. I, I never forget the, the what, once I won that award I was telling you about earlier, I didn't know anything about cellular radio. Never, never heard of it. It was in our organization. But right after they broke up the Bell system, the technology that nobody wanted was the cellular radio system. You know, and that they had tried to send it to the telephone companies, right? And then they sent it back to AT&T, right? So we had this sort of displaced group of people, right? I know, forget the day my, my, my boss, his name was Jess Turner, he said, Jesse, I know you don't want this job, right? To hit the cellular radio group, but I believe that the future of communications will be deeply rooted around this concept of cellular radio. And I never will forget the first day I was on the job, I called the meeting of all the managers and so they were all white. I was the only black guy, right? And I was saying, well, what's the problem, right? Why, why? Because they were losing so much money, it was pathetic. They were just losing money like you wouldn't believe. You know, they said, the problem is that we could only make money when people are in the cars and the phone rings and they answer it. If they don't answer, it goes, it's that most of the time people are not in the cars, right? And so what I said was, well, that seems like an easy problem to solve, right? Why don't we just take the phone out of the car and just put it on the people? And I said, I guarantee you, if you put the phone on the people, I was thinking about just making money, right? So I said, I said, Gage, if you put the phone on the people, when it rains, they'll grab the phone. And I said, every time they grab the phone, we'll make a dollar, right? You know, right? You can tell the brother coming from the street, right? It's like selling stuff, right? So, so I said, every time they the phone, right? We'll make a dollar, man. And I said that, uh, that, that we could turn the business around. At the time, I didn't know that the phones looked like the ones and they had these big bodies, you know? And so y'all look like you about it, right? And so they, they were very nice and they didn't say, look, it was kind of stupid for you to think that we could actually put these kind of phones on people, right? <laughs> so they said that, no, no, the problem is there are more people than there are cars and we had designed this for cars. And so there's not enough spectrum to allow us to put that many people. That's why you can't do that, right? Then I said, oh, that's what your problem is. What they didn't know, I was probably one of the leading authorities in signal, digital signal processing. Uh, because that's how I'd gotten the award before, but they didn't know that, right? So what I said was, oh, I, oh, that's a simple problem to solve. 
what we'll do is that we'll completely digitize the speech, we'll substantially reduce the amount of bandwidth required on a per user basis, and I describe to them how you could do that, by what modulation schemes you would use and so forth. And then I said, if you do the math on that, and I can show you how we do that, that you could get four times the number of people in the same amount of spectrum. And it took us from like 1984 to 88, and we built the first digital cellular system any place in the world. And we took that business from like about a $100 million business to $5 billion, simply because I challenged, I had so much self-confidence, right? that I was able to challenge the status quo. In the midst of all the stereotypes about African-Americans, in the midst of an all white group, that I had enough self-confidence to say what I believed, right, that could be done. Mr. Russell's innovations have continued with his own company, Inc. Networks, and is developing telecommunications for the future. So in the future, People were not just making voice calls or doing text messaging or data. They were actually will be doing video calls like this as they walk around, not just with between two people, but right. between groups of people. So you have a situation now in the cellular communications industry where the devices, from an innovation point of view, is outstripping, outstripping the innovations in the network. Right. I mean, so you can build be the fanciest device you want here, mm -hmm. but there's no network to talk to it that can deliver the bandwidth that's needed to do these very fancy things that they talk about with iPhones and iPads, right? Then you have a very limited thing where if you want more bandwidth on this device, then it's better to put the radio transmitters inside the building. And, and once you do that, you now can build a very broadband signal going up as well as coming down. Now you change the whole tenor of how you design cellular systems. But, but, and, and that's basically what we did. I used to go out in Black History Month when I was at Bell Labs, right, speaking to young kids, six, seven, eighth grade kids, right? And one of the most touching things that I ever experienced, I was speaking to a sixth grader. And she says to me, she says, are you a real inventor? And I said, yeah, I'm an inventor. And I sort of talked about cell phones and I invent cell phones. She says that, well, I thought all black inventors were dead. No, I, I, th I think one of the greatest stories that ever been told is the contribution of black Americans in the 60s and the 70s and the contributions that they've made in technology. To be able to teach young people that the scientists, engineering, and mathematics are the foundation of our society. The satisfaction that you get when you look back, like today, when I see how many people can use cellular telephone systems, and, and many people talk to me all the time and say, well, I didn't know that it was a black guy that invented digital cellular communications. So now, I think we all learned a new lesson. When in doubt, and it's good, give the credit to black folks before anybody else, all right? That's our new lesson. When you don't know, when it's something positive, give the credit to your brother or sister. When there's something bad and negative, and you don't know who created it, give it to somebody other than your brother and sister. That makes sense? Yeah. Now, I know that that's motivating, it's good to see. And it, I mean, it makes me feel good every time. I enjoy sitting back. I've seen it a million times. But even to watch, because when I saw it, I was like, nah, it's not, no. But what we don't realize is that the chip in the personal computer that allows us to have a thing called a personal computer was created by a black man. If he didn't create it, you could not have a personal computer, which meant now we know you wouldn't have a cell phone if it wasn't for black people. You wouldn't have a personal computer that you can go around and do your assignments on. But wait a minute. The first thing to land on Mars, the name of it was a ship, a small ship called Sojourner. 
Sojourner? Who's Sojourner? The real Sojourner Truth was a black woman who was a freedom fighter in America, fighting against the enslavement of African people. One of the bravest black women in the history of the world. Just like a queen in Zinga, she was just on the other side of the world, fighting for our freedom. When many men were too afraid to fight. So Journal Truth is one of those black women, when you say that name to a black person from America, we just get excited. She's like a mother of our nation. Like names like Harriet Tubman and Ida B. Wells, but these were freedom fighting black women. Well, the technology to create the first vehicle or vessel that could reach Mars, there was a black woman engineer who did it. And she said, I'll make it, but we're going to call it Sojourner. After my ancestors, Sojourner Truth. So we're talking about traveling to Mars. We look at the space program, we go, white folks are so brilliant. <laughs> but what we don't realize, the head engineer some years ago at NASA, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. The space program, we're not talking about the head student engineer in your school. We're not talking about the top engineer in your nation. We're not talking about the top engineer on the continent. We're talking about the top scientists in the world was from Ethiopia and headed the NASA program. So now we see, wow, black people are doing all these things that we don't even realize we're doing. But here's the question. We don't even have to talk about all these different things. We just talk about this. There's over a billion Chinese in the world. Not Asians, just Chinese and all over a billion. Almost every one of them got a cell phone. Over a, close to a billion African people on the planet. All of us, we got two or three of them time. Everybody around the world is going around with this, which means this invention has created the kind of wealth that we might not have a name for the number of how many dollars or shillings that it's made. So the question is, if this was developed and created from African greatness and African ingenuity, black people made this, then shouldn't the wealth of the world be reflected in how we're living there? Shouldn't some substantial percentage of the money that is made from this industry be with our people? Shouldn't you walk outside in Uganda and walk along golden paved roads because we're just so rich? Because not only has everybody on the planet got one, but it's at the point now where we can't even imagine the planet without this type of technology, which means it's not only the money that's being made yesterday or today, but this is indefinite. How much money will be generated from this? And yet, there's not 1% of the wealth generated from this invention that is being used by Africans to build our race. Yet, 100% of the brilliance and ingenuity and intellect that went into creating this came from us. Those numbers don't add up. I'll give an analogy of what I'm saying. This is what has happened around the world. Imagine if the different groups of people around the world are vehicles. Well, you know a vehicle, you got many different types of vehicles. But no matter what type of vehicle you have, it must run. And in order for it to run, it needs what? Fuel. So you take your vehicle, you drive to the station pump, you pay money, and put fuel in your vehicle. Now the vehicle is a race, the white race. Come, you put fuel in the vehicle, and you can go so far. And then after some time, you return to the pump to get more fuel to go further. You're driving that engine with the fuel for you to progress forward. African people, are the fuel, the intelligence, the culture, where you go in the world where they don't listen to black people's music. Matter of fact, most places, if you ain't got no black music, they don't have no music. 
I mean, if they're not listening to reggae, if they're not listening to Abby, if it's not hip hop, we make the music for the world. Yet, we are slaves even in the industry that is profitable that even we create. So we're the fuel that the world goes to the pump and pumps into the tank for their group and drives their race forward and we look at them and go, wow, these are amazing the things that these groups are doing. Not realizing that if they didn't have the African fuel, intellect, culture, personality, creativity, that none of these vehicles would drive. None of them. And so the Arabs have come in to Sudan, to Morocco, to all these regions in the north, Tanzania from the side. The Arabs have come in and used our people as fuel to make Arabia strong. The Europeans have come into the west and the south and used African people as fuel and become powerful throughout the universe so that even with no information, when I asked you the question, who came up with this technology? You said it must be whites. <laughs> because we so used to being fuel, we just automatically go into the car. The pump fuels itself. But this is what's so bad about the situation. Not only are other races coming, and taking the fuel, which is African people, and pumping the cars for their racial destiny and progress. But we have become so backwards all around the world that now, where it was original, when you drive to the gas pump to get your fuel, you pay and you got your gas. Now it's even worse. We will actually take the best African minds. We do this in America. We do this here in, in, in Uganda. You do what we do it in Nigeria. We will take the best African minds. And once we realize that they are the best, they are the most brilliant, we dig deep in our pockets with all the money that we generate. And we say, what is the whitest of the white schools? And we pay the whites and pay the Arab and pay any other group to take the best that we had. We give them money, take them, and use them to fill your greatness. And then we're surprised when we wake up in the morning and we have very little and they're producing everything. Because we've become the fuel for them, we don't even use the fuel for our own development. But now, when they drive to the pump, instead of paying for fuel, they drive to the pump which is African people, it's us. And we pull out money to give them to fuel their car and wish them well on their way. The point is, the greatness which is African people, if we unite and put aside those things that separate us, and concentrate on those things we have in common, which is our oneness. It's real simple. You wanna know what black men have in common? All you have to do is get them in a real intense argument. Black men from anywhere in the world. And they're about ready to go at each other's throat. I mean, they're about ready to fight. And all you gotta do is send a beautiful black woman, radiant by both of them. And even in the midst of wanting to go to war, one brother said he stopped and lose his concentration. That's a black man. So once he see that black woman walk by, he said, okay, wait, hold on for that. Hold that right there. Let me get this look. And the other brother go, why is he stopping? He looked to him. He said, okay, all right. Let's take a pause for the cause. Let's look at this beauty, which is Africa. This is our mother. This is our wife. This is our daughter. This is the black woman. And that can mediate no. Then after that, once she gone by, and we're in the process, whoa, that's a beautiful woman. Now we can get back to what we were talking about. We got some things in common. We love our women, black women. You want to know if you have something in common. Across the board, you might not speak the same language. All you got to do is see what's happening if a child is minding their business and doing nothing wrong. A little black child in some 
unscrupulous individual comes by and tries to abuse a child in front of you. Instantly, a black woman from anywhere in the world who sees the child that looks like them being abused for no reason, you become angry. What are you doing this for? Why? No, this child has done nothing to you. That's a black woman in the world. You're not supposed to do that to a child. Don't talk to the child like that. Don't abuse the child. What is going on? These are things we have in common. We're the same race of people. Many different languages. Many different foods. But we're the same race of people. And anywhere we wish and desire to go as a race of people, we can go. However, before we can decide to go anywhere, we first have to decide, just like every other race, that the most important thing to a black person is to be working with their brother or sister for progress for our people. If we are afraid to be African and proud, and we are afraid to love ourselves, and we are afraid to tell someone who has a cheaper product than us, then our brother or sister, no, I'm not buying it. Why? Because I can get the same thing from my brother or sister. What is more expensive? Doesn't matter. The cost is brotherhood. The cost is sisterhood. And besides, if I spend my money with my brother or sister, the more that we do that, and the more we stop spending it with others, then my brother or sister can reduce their prices because I'm making them wealthy. I'm making them uh, 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 develop wealth, and I'm cutting off the pump to the outsiders that are using us to generate wealth and development for the whole world. Is everybody understanding what I'm saying here? Yeah. Now, I mean, are you really understanding? So let's talk. We're going to go into some discussion. Now, the young lady asked a question. She said, what about the black people like the Obamas and others that are doing things that are negative for black people? I'm assuming she's talking about a lot of them that are homosexual. They're doing this weird stuff. Don't they have a choice not to do this stuff? Can't they do on their own? Well, I'll give a brief answer when I'm going to this and it'll show it in a better light so you can get a better understanding. But, as it relates to Obama, just so you're clear of how the politics, the international politics, I'm not talking about in Africa. Even though people talk about leadership in Africa and we know that there are corruptions, there's a lot of corruption in Africa, however, African leaders are more leaders of their country than the presidents of the West are actually leaders. In other words, when you see a president of an African nation, he usually does have power to change things in that nation. He really does have an ability, whether he does it or not, to do something positive or something negative to affect the nation. When you look at international politics, it's very different. The individual you see, like Obama, has no power whatsoever. They make no decisions. The white so-called Jew is completely in control of all decisions that are made on this planet as it relates to the West. But even the whites that you see many times, they do as they are told by the Jews. So that when you see Obama, if he's promoting homosexuality and telling African nations, if you don't accept it, we're gonna hold back your funding. He's doing it because he's been told to do it, and he's gonna do whatever he's been told to do, or they'll remove him and put somebody else in there. And before these individuals are put before you, they have already made the decision that they have promised and sworn to do whatever they're told. So when you see leaders in the West, you're looking at an individual. If you're trying to understand that individual, you're confused about the political landscape. You need to understand the group behind all of the decision making then it won't matter who they put in front of you, that's not important. You understand the mindset of the group that's behind all of it, and that's the white so-called Jews, which we have some videos that can go into that. But I don't want to, well, actually, now that you mention it, I can say something to you. We have another thing that we have back home. It's the same we have in Warner Horizon. I can show you better than I can tell you. I'm gonna say it again. I can sit up here for two hours and give you all this information. Oh, I love that guy. But you have to decide whether you believe me or not. Or I can do something that's far more beneficial to you. I can show it to you so you see it. Beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt, you have no need to decide whether you believe me or not. You are now armed forever because you've seen it, you understand it, and now you can go find it for yourself. So what I'm gonna show you now 
is the process of taking control of the minds of African people and using us to wage war of destruction against our own people. I'm going to say it again. One of the ways that the white so-called Jew operates and fights, they much prefer for you to kill your sister and your sister to kill her brother. They would prefer you to fight and for them not to be seen than to physically come to you one-on-one -on -one and try to fight you. So, I'm going to show you what they did to black people in America, and I'm going to tell you why they did it. Then I'll show you how it was done. In the late 1980s, our musicians in America had started looking at what was going on in South Africa and all of the freedom struggles in Africa. Thomas Sankara and these other brothers and sisters that were fighting for freedom in Africa. And then he started to put the information in the music telling us as young black children in America that we were Africans and that what was happening to our brothers and sisters in Africa was our fight too. So we began to become very hostile to whites in America because they were funding and fueling the South Africans, the whites of South Africa, and the present black people. So we became conscious of our connection. We started taking our gold chains off of our necks and putting on African medallions. And that became a representation of who we are. No matter how far away we are from our mother continent, we still Africans. And we became very, very, very aggressive in our blackness. They saw it as a humongous threat because they said this wave is reaching children through music. And if they grow up revolutionary as children, they're not cowards like their parents. They're not afraid of the same things. If they grow up thinking we must fight, when they become adults, their children will be fighting our children. They said we have to turn this aggression either off or we gotta turn it in on themselves. So I'm gonna show you so you can see what was happening. Then I'm gonna show you who turned it and how it was turned. So it will answer your question. Can't they make the decision for themselves? You will see the magician who pulls the strings on the destruction of black people. You'll see it right now. They can never take this away from you. So feel good that once you leave this room, you have something that can never be taken from you that you can understand how the destruction of African people works. So, in the late 80s, the strongest group it was a new music called hip hop, rap, y'all know it. And it was created by some people and then a group came and said, let's stop just talking about nothing. Let's start talking about being black and proud and standing up for ourselves. Let's talk about freedom fighting and, and ruling the world. Let's talk like that. So they became so popular that they were the most popular group in hip hop and everybody respected them. <coughs> And so they got all the brothers and sisters who were in hip hop together to say, look, we have too much violence in the community where we fight each other. We need to stop all the violence, black people against each other. So let's come together, all of us, and make a song that talks about us not fighting each other and recognizing that we're not each other's enemy. There's an enemy out there that's trying to make us fight each other. Let's not do that. So this is what hip hop sounded like in 1988, 1989. I'm gonna play the song for you, it's called Self Destruction. And the song is saying self destruction, you're headed for self destruction. Basically saying don't get involved in killing your brothers and sisters. Stop that behavior, let's work together for our future.
Now what makes this so relevant? What's decent? Which makes this so relevant? These were not obscure entertainers. These were the top entertainers at the time who by themselves, with no permission, made the decision as black men and women to give a message to the young people to do the right thing and progress, work together as black people and take care of their interests. So this music had become a lifeline for self-respect. I'm gonna show you what happened. The whites became very afraid of this because this same idea was being pushed into politics. And now black people in America were fighting to free South Africa, fighting with the Thomas St. Cars in the world, fighting with all the other brothers and sisters around the African world that were trying to do positive things. So this is what happened. They said, we have to find a way to change from black people talking about working together, men respecting women and women respecting men. Stop making them think that they're brothers and sisters and that they are Africans and make them think that they have no value and that they should kill one another. And if we say it to them, they will not believe us. We have to get people that look like them, that have the same rhythm, the same spirit, but who have negative intentions to sing it to them. And since they won't see us, we will then tell them and pay these black people to say, kill your brother, murder your sister, rape that little girl. We'll teach them that this is good through using their own people. And then we will change the aggression that is against white supremacy and white invasion of Africa or white police officers murdering black people to, I hate my own sister, I hate my own brother, I rape my own child, I destroy my own community. Because they will not see that we are the ones making it happen. So, they put money and backing behind a group called NWA. The N is a negative word, the most negative word for a black person in the West. It's called nigga. It's a word that our ancestors killed for and died for if anybody would call them that. Because they said, no, I know my history and culture. You cannot take my roots from me. And the white said, no, you a thing that has no value to be destroyed and brutalized. You are a nigga. So we fought that word for 500 years. They said, we're gonna give these guys that use this word, money and popularity, to ravage the minds of the children, the black children in America first and then around the world. I'm gonna show you now, because they never thought we would figure out what happened. After 25 years, where all of the music in the United States of America has gone in this direction to tell us to create self-destruction, the things that you have become addicted to, the Nicki Minaj, the Lil Wayne, all homosexuals, all lesbians, all degenerates, all self-hating, all are paid to implant in the minds of African people self-destructive behavior. And we think that it's coming from our own people because they're black on the surface, but behind the scenes there are whites that are paying them and engineering every negative message that's destroying the culture. When you see pornography on the street corners and your children are watching it, there are whites who have sponsored black people to bring it in, you get it, you think it's cool, you show it and you're destroying and ravaging the minds of your own children here. We've seen it, it's here. But I can show you the process of how this works. I want you to listen. Because now that it's been 25 years, the whites start telling on themselves, not knowing that we are watching to put the pieces together. The individual behind financing the whole genre of music called Gangsta Rap that tells black people to kill each other and rape our women and destroy our own culture was a white so-called Jew named Jerry Heller. His language is gonna be very vile, but I want you to listen to him talk about the fact that he changed the music from the positive direction it was going to the direction he wanted it to go. A white so-called Jew, Jerry Heller. You'll find that you ask me questions, Sergio, and I answer whatever the fuck I feel like answering. So um, I loved 
what was happening there. I loved the rap scene. And I thought that it was a viable scene because I didn't like Bronx rap. I call it the era of gold chains and big dicks, you know? Guys wearing gold chains walking around holding their crotches. So it wasn't musical and it didn't have any kind of humor to it and no sense of humor to their music. So when I heard what was happening on the West Coast, I liked that. Mm -hmm. So while I, while I liked, you know, the Dream Team and J.J. Fed, in fact, I liked them a lot. When I heard Straight Outta Compton, I said to myself, wow, this is a combination of the Rolling Stones and the Black Panthers and Gil Scott Heron and the Last Poets. I mean, this is a copy, I mean, a combination of those ingredients. I said, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be in the NWA business. Well, Gradually. we became uh, like father and son. You know, because remember, he was in his early 20s, I was in my mid 40s at the time. So we became like father and son, like teacher and student. So our relationship was unheard of for a almost middle-aged white Jewish businessman to have a relationship like that with a early 20s ex-drug ex dealer from Compton. You know, Easy always said that I was the first white man that he ever that he ever really met that wasn't wearing a police uniform. So our relationship developed into a, not only a, a teacher-pupil, but a father-son kind of relationship. Yeah, and it must be something great to know you were behind, you know, a very uh, revolutionary change in the music industry, you know, as far as with Ruthless and Easy e Well, Sergio, I've been involved with the Panthers. I represented Ike and Tina Turner. I believe that the most important thing, contribution that I've ever made to the music business was, was NWA and Ruthless Records. Yeah. You decide, is Jerry Heller the white devil or is Jerry Heller the founding genius of gangster rap? So ma'am, I want to make this relevant to you so you see how it worked. I want you to see exactly how they did this. Because it's the same thing they're doing here with minor changes. They finance black people to teach us about killing and murdering each other. Then the president of the United States at that time, George Bush Sr., met with the leader of that group and made an agreement. As long as you continue to tell black people to do drugs and kill themselves, we will make you rich. So we're talking about from the top levels of government, the agreement to make music permanently etch and killing black people. And what did they do? This is how they did it. They said, okay. First, they brought drugs into our community called crack cocaine and devastated our community. And they gave it to young people so that they were poor and could make money. And so we began to sell drugs to each other. After a while, it destroyed so much of our family that many of us said we're not gonna sell drugs anymore. So they said, we have a better plan. Instead of selling drugs, we'll take this new music that we have. We will pay the popular entertainers to sing songs about selling drugs. They don't actually have to sell the drug. They'll sing a song about it. They'll sing songs about shooting and killing black people. They'll sing songs and they'll have half-naked black women walking around looking like they're these big guys and popular because they can get their women to be naked and degenerate. And we'll make that popular. And instead of killing one or two drug dealers here and there, now you have someone singing a song to a five-year-old who, if their parents were watching them, would never have been involved in drug selling. But now they don't have to be in the street to get into bad behavior. Now. It is going through the earphones into the mind of the child, looking like it's coming from somebody black that looks like them, telling them to do the same behavior that's going to get them killed or thrown in jail. Now, once they began that process, it worked like a charm. Brothers who used to be best friends start pulling out guns and murdering each other. 
We start glorifying selling drugs, glorifying raping our women, glorifying it was okay to go rape a child. It was okay to be a homosexual. Everything in our culture began to fall apart. Just totally decimate everything that we had known. And when that happened, they said, we can get rich off of this. So this is what they did. They said, instead of having prisons being owned by the government, private investors can invest in purchasing a prison. And as long as you keep paying these entertainers to give messages to the children and young people to participate in behavior that will get them locked up, you can make as much money you want with a prison because we know that the children are going to commit crime and get locked up because you're feeding them the information that will drive them in that direction. So I'm going to give you an example of how it works so you can see the kind of wealth the kind of fuel we are for the European system. People look at Lil Wayne and say, oh man, Weezy, oh Wayne making a million dollars a year. He's rich. Let's see how rich he is. If Lil Wayne makes a million dollars a year, that's a lot of money. US dollars, right? We think it is. But private prisons get paid $40,000 per year for every inmate they have. So in other words, you got a business, you have a prison, and for every person that gets locked up for a year, you get $40,000. So now we have to see, how many children does Lil Wayne have to impact their thinking to commit a crime that will get them locked up for at least one year? In most cases, when you commit crimes in the US, you get locked up for way longer than a year. But let's just say if it was just a year. If how many of them would he have to do that they would make their million dollars back. Well, you take one million, you divide it by 40,000, all he has to do is get 25 black men, boys, to listen to him talk about selling drugs and shooting people, shoot somebody, and go to jail, and they made their million dollars back. But from the US, I can tell you, if there are 40 major cities in the United States, it's at least 2,500 per year in every one of those cities. So it ain't no 25 that it's going. So if we just use 2,500, which is a small number of how many minds he impacts to go into prison, then that's $40,000 a year times each year, times 2,500 of our sons and daughters that get locked up. They make $100 million minus the $1 million they pay Lil Wayne they make $99 million with him making a song that gets our children confused to create bad behavior, get locked up, and they get rich. So every artist that you hear is telling you something that is bad for your culture because it makes them richer than you can possibly count the numbers for. The U.S. is the largest jailer on planet Earth right now. Why? because it's the biggest business. It is the enslavement of African people all over again, except this time it's not on the sea. It's in the prison industrial system, and it uses our own talent, corrupted, to destroy us. Tech and the New York the Geo Group prison company. Well, that part of the story. Simply put, the If a person or individual invests $85 million in them, how much money are they making? 
he invests 80 million, 85 million dollars of his money in enslaving the black people. The brother just brought up a great point. You should know that the guy they are showing there is the person who said that they are weapons of mass destruction. Remember that story? The one who came up with the rumors of mass destruction, that was the guy. And the same guy who invests a lot of money in prison. Man, the brother brought up a good point. Y'all remember that song, Self Destruction, what it sounded like, right? Yes. I'm going to play you a little bit of two songs so you can hear how the music changed and what we have been taught to listen to now. So you can understand. Now, I can show you better, I can tell you. Instead of going through all of this, let me show you. Because it's very important, there's nothing more important really than this discussion I'm giving you now. Because on a practical basis, you are young people. You are either going to decide that this culture is going to completely permeate and destroy your society, or that you're going to turn it away. I'm going to show you what the end is, so you can see, this ain't no talk, I'm going to show you what young black children because we failed to prevent this from permeating in African culture in America. Let me show you how sick and homosexual our sons and daughters have become in the U.S. because of this. So that you can understand why you have to fight this. See, when somebody is telling you, is it okay to be homosexual, we shouldn't hate people and all this stuff, if you don't like this, this is what you are in school for.
I think it's a first year student. And she's on, she wants to make sure of an African movie, Makere. I want to ask you third year students and the rest, I'm giving some chance that you can come and contribute to be part of this movement. So talk about the African pride and being part of Africa. Just don't sit there, you just need to get, you get the right information. But as you want this, you know the kind of music we get every day. Eh? Some of the music really, I can tell you, I, 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 some of the things they do, I'm telling you, personally. You heard someone say, Now the idea is really, it's a nice song. But what, what do you mean by I don't care what you say. My work is I'm making my work, my money. Then you heard someone like, Kwata Wakati, those some of the songs really, and then there are more to that. They, they go deeper. And then there's a time the guy came from Jamaica. Was it Elephant something? Elephant, elephant man. <laughs> and you know what he did on the, on the stage in Kampala? <laughs> Some people had never imagined somebody can do that on a public stage. It was an abuse and insult. But that's how it begins. And then over the day, everybody does it. If you watch young kids' talks, or we go to this uh, children's nursery school, wherever, you kind of get shocked the kind of music the kids are dancing with. But it's by dealing with our mind. And we need some people who say, you know what, my mind is my world. I'm not showing you this to be gone. What I'm saying to you is, we are the test rats, lab rats of America. When they want to destroy African culture, they do it on us first. Once they perfect it, they take it throughout the world. I'm showing you this so that you will not be able to not know the impact that this filthy pornography, this filthy music, this filthy degeneracy that you're listening to and it's being presented as real music is going to do to your culture. I want you to see what's going to happen to your children. I know it because our children are your children because we're all one race. They've done it to us. I can show you what we're fighting daily, day and night in America. This is how bad it's gotten. I'm going to first show you a festival that they have in Atlanta every year. Four to five, six, seven thousand people come in. This is how sick our people are of what they're doing. These are males that come to compete. What you're about to see, these are males, not women. And this is what this culture leads to. <laughs> The hip hop music, I'm going to show you right now. Now, I'm going to show you one more. Because, see, I want you to see, it starts the music you heard at first when I played. Calling black women bitches and whores. Having black women get half naked and It starts there. That's not where it ends. It starts calling brothers out of their name, you nigga like this. It starts with negative words. And then treating the women like garbage and trash. That's where it starts. So when you see sisters starting to wear mini skirts, when you see them trying to follow this Western stuff, you're seeing the death of your culture. When you see your brothers starting to wear their pants hanging off their behinds and trying to sound like the black people in America and using language, mush up like nigga. <laughs> They're taking death culture. It's funny in the beginning, but the end is not funny. Let me show you now, because now that they took all the self-respect out of our culture, now they show what their real objective is. Now they're forcing every black person to be a homosexual. And they're taking our children from us. They're uh, teaching them to be homosexual in the schools. They're adopting our children and taking them away. If you're a parent in America and you're a black parent, and you spank your child so that they don't do bad stuff, they lock the parents up and take the children away because 
They can't make money if your children behave well because they won't go to jail. So they don't want you to be able to discipline your child. At the same time, if you don't discipline your child, the child goes to jail and they can make the money. So when that happens, they teach the homosexuality when they take the child into the foster care system or when they put them in prison. Everything is designed to strip the decency and sanity away from us. So now that same music that started with us talking about killing each other, it has gone deeper. Now all of the stuff you get from the United States of America is purely 100% white sex, which means homosexuality and pedophilia, sexual abuse of children, sexual insanity. And the impact it's having on our little children is what's coming here if you don't go out there and say, we absolutely will stop it. Let me show you what's coming. This is the hip hop man. His mother was so fucking proud. Oh, I'm that nigga on my fucking boy. I'm proud. Oh, when I swear I'm right that nigga on my towel. Oh, I said, my dick looking straight ass with like 3D glasses. Oh, I got three gay niggas with three fat asses. Your responsibility 
to do something about it. So what I want to do now, because we got to wrap up very shortly, I want to take any questions anybody has in the room. I know you will have some questions, because we dropped a lot of heavyweight stuff on you today. OK, we have five minutes to try those questions, because another class will come in at exactly five, and I have to be out. I will leave you five minutes. If you have to speak, you must speak in less than a minute. Including Mr. Fadil Mande, including uh, Mr. Ilumba, anyone has to speak in less than a minute. Can you do that? If you want to say something, just walk straight quickly here and say something or ask a question. So we have five minutes for that. Let's start a minute. Thank you very much, sir. I have a question. Is Christianity, is Christianity a religion that was created? To, to all the African people. Is Christianity a religion that was created to rule African people? Is Christianity a religion that was created to rule African people? Okay, can we have another question? Another question? Let's talk about Christianity. Okay. Uh, my name is Natasha Emily Lankin. First of all, I'd like to appreciate all the information, but after all that's been said and done, what do we do about this? Where do we go from here? What is straight black crime about? How do we uh, make a foundation for this and how do we organize ourselves to do something about it? Okay, what is next after this and what is about straight black crime? I'm going to talk about Western aid for African, African nations. Western aid. Less than a minute. Ask a question. I, I only want to, talk, uh, to, to, to ask uh, what you think about this Western aid and for Africa. What do you think about Western aid in Africa? I need two more people. Thank you very much. My question goes to you. I want to ask you, uh, uh, Currently, we are seeing Africa being divided into three. That's uh, Sahara, Sub-Saharan, and West Africa. They could like white South Africa. So what are we going to do to unite as Africans together and stop talking but do the action? Okay, no more questions. This is enough. Okay, now we realize Africans have the best knowledge and coming up with all the innovations. But now in the market for innovation, Africans we are poor compared to the rest of the world. And most of the world and most of the market is with them. So how do we manage to market our own when the people with the real finances are there? Okay. Don't have you the last question. Thank you very much. My question is pretty good. Um, what are some of the basic strategies the African have come up with restore the lost dig dignity of African nation. Okay, what have the Africans did and what have they done to restore the lost glory of Africa? Now, I want to ask uh, Mr. Fajir Mani, one minute before he responds. One minute, just say anything concerning this. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say to you, somebody is targeting you, beginning with your money. Yeah. They want you to lose your dignity, so that's why. Hopeless punk, you can see what is happening. I will see if I keep a vice chancellor here, I will burn such noise. You can't have that cacophony at a campus where people are standing. I get it. This is all our mind being better. Somebody is targeting you. Watch, protect your dignity. Watch what is dangerous against you and do what you believe is ours. If we have to copy, then we shall copy the correct thing. Thank you. Thank you. One minute. One minute. Five minutes to wrap it up. Everything. I'm sorry. Because we, you know, had that and I, I'm not getting the chance to answer each question. I wish I did. So what I'll do, uh, because of that, is I'll focus on the solution. I think. I think that everybody's looking for solutions now.
You got all this stuff dropped on you out here. If you dropped all this, let me tell you. And this is how we came to this. That's what I've been spending the last, uh, since I was 15, trying to figure out. I'm 41 now, so that's 26 years. 26 years I spent studying the problem and understanding it. Because you can't answer a question like that until you first actually identify what the problem is. I'm sharing it with you now so that before you decide whether you want to even take this fight or not, you know what's at stake. Now, why do you create the straight black pride movement? This is what has to happen. Because the different groups, whether it's the whites in Christianity, the Arabs in Islam, the Hebrews in Judaism, uh, the different political groups, everything that they've done, the object has been to divide us. Because like the fingers, it's easy to break if it's divided. When it's together like this, it's not that easy to break. So since we are divided among so many different lines, when we looked at the question, she said, how do we fix the problem? We realized the first thing that we have to do to even talk about what the problem is, is to define it. Once it's defined, to fix it, we must define who we are and what we have in common. Because those things we have in common can supersede the differences and now we can create strategies to come forward. So we said we talked to people around the world who were black and African and doing the work for our people. And we had all these disagreements, but there were three things that we agreed on. And we said that becomes now the basis for international African unity and development. The first one, we're straight. We know that men are supposed to be with women and we're hostile against any other forces. What is so beautiful about that, whenever you find a hot button issue, not only does it pique the interests of people, but if you take it and you work towards it, it develops economics. Because in order to take that social issue, you gotta have shirts. You have to have foods that represent what you're talking about. You have to have uh, 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 things like this when people come, so you can charge. You gotta have music that does it. When you find an issue, that people agree on, now you have to create the things to give it life. Each of those things requires people to do things that cost. Now we can start spending money with each other because we have an idea that we agree on and we have to give it life. Two was black. The black man is supposed to be with the black woman. If we can't get that part right, then we can't do any of this. So we said we all agree. Black man with black woman, black woman with black man, and that was it. It's simple. And three, we agree. We are not going to be able to move forward without any dignity. We're not going to do anything talking to each other in a negative manner, looking at each other negatively, and mistreating each other. We're not going to go anywhere trying to emulate everybody else. Why? Because when we emulate others, we make them rich. Let me show you what I'm saying. And I'm going to use my beautiful sisters as an example. When the black woman sees her natural self as beautiful, and when her men let her know that her natural self is beautiful, then she wears her hair in its natural texture. And the only people who can take that hairstyle and make it beautiful in different ways are other black women. The only people that can make products to make that natural hair beautiful and take care of our other black people. So then all of the money about her beauty and being her natural self goes to other black people and it is an entire industry. However, when the black woman sees her enemy and outsiders as the standard of beauty and when her men rather stand that by chasing those standards of beauty, then she no longer wants her natural texture of hair. So she doesn't see her natural self as beautiful, she wants to look like them. So she chases the products that can change her from who she is to make her look like them. Who makes those products? Them, because those products are for them. So now, nobody in Africa makes a dollar of what would be the beauty for the black woman because the black woman is chasing an image that belongs to some enemy of hers and she goes out and makes them rich because 
that they make the products that she needs to create a false sense of beauty which is not herself. So the industry is created in the pride. Once you have pride and dignity of your African self, you are no longer asking the question, how much does this honey cost? You walk into the store, you turn it on the back. If it says, made to my country, which one of these honey tastes the best? You never tasted the honey before. You look at the bottle of honey, you turn it over, it says made in China. That was not that good. You take the bottle and you look on the back and it says made in the US. That honey's not that good. You look on the back and it says made in Africa. This is the best tasting honey, I'm sure, I'm certain of it. That's what you got. Now, who cares how it tastes? Every African is only buying honey that's made in Africa from other Africans. So whoever makes honey around the world makes nothing off of us. Now we have bee farms that are so humongous with people who raise their children up to have an industry. They're not going to find no job. You raised from three years old, you know how to take care of bees because they make honey. And black folks know that the sweetest honey on planet Earth is made by other black folks. So guess what? Every dollar we spend to get some sweet goes through the black industry. And now we can start competing in markets and taking other people's markets. In fact, once you have self-respect, you can reduce things so well, you can start making other folks come give you their money for your stuff. Last thing I'll say, and it goes to her question, that's why we created this movement. We first had to create the idea and the structure for black people to unify. That's what this is. Now, every different chapter around the world, we have one here in Uganda, under the leadership of Achille, the young man Achille. Can you please wave your hand? This young man is from Nigeria, studying here in Uganda. He's going to be leader of the Straight Black Pride Movement. You'll be hearing more from him. He's going to help figure out the Ugandan brothers and sisters, your decision to figure out how do we take this Straight Black Pride. It doesn't belong to us, it belongs to every African who believes in those principles. How do we take that and use it to create social change and economic change? But now, under this guise, whatever we produce, as long as it's straight, it's black, and it's proud, we can now decide we're gonna spend with each other, we can make one another wealthy instead of making the rest of the world wealthy. Last thing I'll say, because I want you to see how this works. Imagine for a minute, we know that Jesse Russell was a brilliant black man. He created the cell phone technology, and thus the cell phone. Imagine, if we had this kind of mentality, and Jesse Russell said, I have a great idea, it will revolutionize the world. And he came to Africa, where the resources are to make a physical cell phone. Yes, I'm finished now. He came to Africa, took his idea, and worked with black investors for the purpose of creating a cell phone. And if the first people on the planet with a cell phone since we came up with the idea with us. Imagine the type of wealth. Because no one can live without it, no matter who made it, if we took our own intelligence, created it, and used it to change and run our own system. So that's what we're gonna do. This movement is designed to fix all the things that we just talked about. I thank you for your time, we've gotta go. I love you, we just to see you on the next I want to thank you so much for coming. We have another lecture coming in. Uh, UFG. Check, check. Brooklyn. Shout out to Lone Star RBGs. Tahe RBGs. United Front. I want to thank y'all, man. University Ave. For all the support, all the love through the years. Stand to the road. Yeah, it's Lamoma's revenge. All my people. Last stop on this train. Make your spirit up. live on forever. The train of liberation. Brothers keep O. Let's go. Queen Jacinta Green, Jake Black, Irritated Genie, what up, brother? Wild. Yeah. Real. Glorious Asiatic. I love y'all. Let's go. The God True. Yeah. I love right. y'all, man, for real. Let's, Let's go. go. 
Yeah. I got so many things to say, but little time to say it. My grandmama told me that your life is what you make it. My ancestors told me human life is what is sacred. And love is something real, but not impossible to fake it. Most brothers base their life on trying to get a sister naked. Game material, possessions, manhood measured by their paper. Self-worth determined by a decimal and comma. Harder to develop honor growing up without a father. We need some body armor, but you waiting on karma to fight. While you puffing on a scarma You can smoke the ganja but you can't escape your problem oh, Saw a brother on a train eating chains like Obama A penny for his thoughts so I gave a man a dollar And he dropped some knowledge on me He had wisdom like a scholar He told me keep cool and never ever follow a fool On the battlefield cause he'll be the groom To recite the fatal nuptials and marry the tomb Always be certain, never try to assume That's that every real. mess could be cleaned with the mop and the broom. Hit every cop in the room if you pop in your oops. Much stains on his clothing and his knuckles all swollen. Listen. It seemed like he was glowing after every word spoken. Listen. His voice sounded raspy from the cigarette smoking. Uh -huh. I dropped some more chains inside the cup that he was holding. I told him keep talking. Uh -huh. He said let's walk. Then yeah. old Malcolm X tape speech is playing in his walkman. It had a button missing and he said that it was given when his daughter came to visit him in prison on Christmas. On Some people kept their distance from the stitch that he emitted. Wow. But they mingled with these dirty, filthy crackers. What's the difference? I asked him for his name and his eyes showed pain uh -huh. like the child that's lost. Searching for mommy in the rain. Uh -huh. I'm the African they stole and beaten, treated like a slave. Uh -huh. I'm the African rebelling, slights and crackers with the blade. The one thrown overboard uh -huh. to drown amidst the waves. The one who sacrificed my life uh -huh. so someone else was saved. The one you keep forgetting whose history's unwritten. I made a contribution, just hoping I made a difference. People call me Mumia, some call me Matulu, some call me Sundiata. Can't get this wisdom on YouTube. The brother who was lynched, cause some house Negro snitched. Beating the cash, straighted body thrown inside a ditch. I'm the one who made the commitment, while others ride the fence. The one, and he stopped short, leaving me in suspense. He pulled out the mirror, asked me, what do you see? He said, brother, I am we, you a reflection of me. That's real. The mama's revenge! The mama's revenge.